Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my lecture series on sustainability issues in energy. In this lecture, we're going to continue our unit on carbon capture, utilization, and storage, and we'll talk about CO2 flow and storage in rocks. I hope you've been enjoying these lectures. Don't forget to like the videos, and if you would, please subscribe to my channel. So let's imagine you want to store some carbon dioxide in the subsurface. What particular types of rocks and what particular locations are you going to do this? Well, let's imagine you've got some kind of a power generation station or an industrial facility where you're capturing CO2 from an exhaust stream, and you can pump it into the subsurface. The places that make the best locations to store it include um, rocks that are full, generally full of salt water. These are generally referred to as saline aquifers. They have a lot of volume available for CO2 storage, so you can just pump it directly down in there. You can pump it into a coal seam, and either the CO2 will just actually stick to the organic matter in the coal, or it can be used to push out some of the methane that's in the coal. This is a process called enhanced coal bed methane or ECBM. And so you'll store your CO2 and you can produce some methane that you can use for you know, power generation or, or what have you. Um, a similar idea has to do with storing CO2 in depleted oil and gas reservoirs, where you can use the CO2 to actually push out some of the oil that's left behind after years and years of production. So in this way, you can produce some more oil from your reservoir and you can leave behind the CO2. So this is a particularly intriguing um, possibility here. So let's talk a little more about how this works at the uh, kind of micro scale. So rocks are actually mostly full of holes. Um, a lot of people might be surprised by this, but they are full of holes. Some of these holes are very small. Um, but they're there, okay? So we refer to a quantity called porosity as the ratio of the void volume to the total volume of the rock, okay? So um, obviously a rock with no voids would have a 0% porosity and um, a rock with a very high number of voids, sometimes you can get up to 60, 70% porosity um, with like, uh, you know, mud that's right at the, at the sea floor. Um, here's a thin section of Berea sandstone. This is a, a standard lithology that's used a lot for uh, rock testing. It's quarried um, in Ohio, actually. This says a sample with 20% uh, porosity. And what we're looking at here, this is a piece of rock that has been cut and polished, and the rock was injected with a blue epoxy prior to cutting and polishing. So everywhere you see blue, that's where the epoxy went. And so you can take that as a pretty good proxy for all the, where all the void volume is. And then these things, so these are the individual grains of sand um, that make up the, what we call the matrix of the rock. So for Berea sandstone, it's almost 90, you know, 95, 98% quartz, um, you know, very, uh, very nice, uh, uh, you know, easily uh, constrained mineralogy there. So you can see the size of this, this is a 100 micron um, scale bar. So these pores are, you know, tens of microns in size. A lot of rocks have pores that are even smaller than that. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, this is basalt. So this is actually an igneous rock, but um, when the basalt cools, a lot of the time it'll develop these, you know, vesicles and other void space where gas, you know, exsolves during the, uh, the cooling and solidification process. This particular sample only has 10% porosity, but I mean, look at how big those pores are, okay? So, um, you know, this is a 4.4 centimeter diameter core. So you're looking at, you know, half a centimeter size pores, those are pretty big. So these could also be a good way of, um, of storing CO2. Now, it's important if you want to put CO2 into the subsurface, not just to have the volume in the rock that's there for it to be stored. You also have to get the CO2 to move through the rock, okay? So there's another quantity that we like to look for, and it's called permeability. So the way we define permeability is it's the ease with which, or it describes the ease with which a fluid will move through a porous medium um, under an, uh, an applied pressure gradient. 
Okay, so if you're flowing very slowly, we call this creeping flow or low Reynolds number flow. This just means that there's no turbulence. The uh, streamlines of the fluid are all parallel to each other. Um, we uh, describe flow in the subsurface using Darcy's law, and that's expressed by this equation here. So this is your uh, fluid velocity um, vector. And over here on the right-hand side, K is the permeability and mu is the viscosity of your fluid. And then this, is, uh, this term describes the pressure gradient. So this is the actual pressure gradient. And then because fluids don't flow just under a hydrostatic pressure gradient, you need to have a pressure above hydrostatic <clears throat> to get them to flow. We have to subtract the hydrostatic pressure gradient from that. So that's what this term represents. It's just the density times gravitational acceleration. And then this is the spatial gradient of the depth vector, which actually is just equal to one, okay? So this is Darcy's law. And um, we usually uh, express permeability in meters squared if you're working in SI units or Darcy's if you're working in, you know, what we call this kind of funky, you know, Darcy system where pressure is in atmospheres, okay? Uh, the conversion between them is that one Darcy is approximately 10 to the minus 12 meters squared, okay? So um, if you want to be really clever, you can start talking about like the area of something in like Darcy's, like, you know, oh yeah, my house is like, you know, 2 billion Darcy's and people will be like, what? And then you'll have to convert it to square feet. So anyway, um, okay, so there is a little bit of a relationship between porosity and permeability. Generally, you'll expect that materials that have more void space um, will allow easier passage of fluid, but that's not always the case because it also has to do with how well connected that pore space is. Um, so, you know, for different types of rocks, you can construct these porosity permeability relationships. Um, this one here on the left, this is for um, um, sandstones, Gulf Coast uh, sandstone. So you can see that, you know, this is on a semi-log um, scale. So permeability is expressed on a logarithmic scale here. You know, generally the things with higher porosity are going to have higher permeability, but if you take a pr particular porosity value, like let's say 15%, you can see there's what? It's like one, two, three, almost, you know, four orders of magnitude variation in permeability. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot of slop in here. Different types of rocks also will have different porosity permeability relationships. So this plot over here, again, is porosity in percent versus permeability here in millidarcies, again, on a logarithmic scale. And you can see that, you know, sandstones generally plot in there, but then carbonates are highly variable. Um, fractured reservoirs typically have low porosity and permeability is all over the place. There's almost impossible in some cases to construct a relationship. And then, you know, chalks, again, are kind of all over the place. Um, the reference lines on here, these are just lines of constant perme permeability to porosity um, ratio. And they're curved, obviously, because we're on a semi-log scale. So that just shows you some of the variability you see here. OK, so that's general properties of rocks. Now, let's talk specifically, specifically about what happens when you inject CO2 into a rock that already has water in it. So you can imagine you're injecting CO2 into, into a saline aquifer. What's going to happen? Well, before we talk about that, I want to talk a little bit about capillary pressure and capillary tubes. So let's imagine you've got a dish full of water. So here's the surface of the water, OK? And this is air. So right here at the air-water interface, the pressure is um, one atmosphere, OK? So if you put, if you stick little glass tubes into the water here, um, the water is going to climb up the tube, OK? And it's going to climb higher in tubes with a smaller diameter. So, and what we observe when we do this is that the height, so the, the distance that that meniscus comes to its stable uh, configuration above the water surface, is inversely proportional to the diameter of the tube. Now, why would that be? So it, it's due to two phenomena called interfacial tension and wettability. So I'll talk about interfacial tension first. So let's imagine you've got an interface between a liquid here and a gas. 
So the molecules in the liquid, as long as they're away from the gas liquid interface, they are going to be very happy. They'll be at, uh, you know, there would be a force balance between the different molecules and they'll all be balanced out because they're all going to be surrounded by other molecules. Okay. Now at the surface, what's going to happen is that these molecules right at the surface have no other liquid molecules up here to balance each other out. And so what happens is to, you know, prevent these molecules from just flying out into space, there will arise a net tension in the plane of this interface. And that's sometimes called surface tension. Uh, it's more generally called interfacial tension. Okay. Now we can describe this thermodynamically. So if we consider that this system um, is at constant pressure, volume, temperature, and entropy, our thermodynamic uh, expression just says that the change in the internal energy is just going to be the opposite of the work done to the system. Okay. So if we're only doing interfacial work, let's not worry about PV work right now. We're, we're doing interfacial work. We can express that work as the change in the area of the interface multiplied by some constant, okay? And that constant is gonna be the interfacial tension. So it's the tension on this interface. And A obviously is gonna be the, the interfacial area. So if we substitute this work here, so again, notice the sign here. So this is work that's being done to the interface. So it has a negative sign. So that negative sign cancels that one out. And we can see that the internal energy change due to a change in the area of the interface is just sigma times that change in the interface. Um, so one thing you'll notice is that if we want to minimize the energy or the change in energy of the system, we want to find a configuration that has the smallest possible surface area. And you might remember back from your geometry that the shape that has the smallest possible interfacial area for a given volume is a sphere. So what happens is that at, at, at equilibrium, a, a liquid gas interface or actually the interface between two immiscible liquids as well, is going to form either a sphere or part of a sphere. And that just is a way of minimizing the interfacial energy. Now there's something else interesting that happens at this curved, um, we'll call it a fluid-fluid interface. So let's imagine a really simple case where you've got a spherical gas bubble immersed in water. Okay, so let's imagine that this bubble, it looks like this, um, and it's got some initial radius we'll call R sub I, okay? So um, let's imagine that the total volume and the total temperature of the whole system, so that's gas bubble plus water, we'll assume that that's constant. So the Helmholtz free energy, which we're gonna call F, is given by the internal energy minus temperature times entropy, okay? so. If we change the interfacial area, we're gonna do pressure volume work and interfacial work, right? Because that's, we're changing the area, but we also have to change the volume of the bubble. So that's gonna be PV work. So let's keep temperature and entropy constant. And so that means that the change in the internal energy is just gonna be due to the work done. So that's gonna be the sum of the PV work and the interfacial work, okay? And that'll equal the change in Helmholtz free energy. So we worked out, um, pardon the pun, <laughs> we, we worked out what the interfacial work is. So now we need to define what the PV work is. So if we increase the volume of the bubble, um, the bubble is going to do work on the water because it has to push that water out of the way, right? And then the water is going to do work on the bubble because it's going to resist that pushing away. So um, these two will have opposite signs, okay? These two, these two PV works. And so we can write this expression here. So the PV work done by the bubble is gonna be bubble pressure times change in volume. And then the work done by the water will have the opposite sign. It's gonna be water pressure times the change in volume. So we can group the DV here and come up with this expression here. So the, the PV work is gonna be the difference between bubble and water pressure times the volume change. Um, this is the expression we came up with for uh, came up with earlier for the interfacial work. 
So if we put these back in our expression for the change in Helmholtz free energy, um, we arrive at this term here. So we've got the PV work and then the interfacial work. Now, because our, our bubble is a sphere, we can come up with an explicit expression for dV in terms of um, the bubble radius. So let's imagine we're changing the bubble radius to a new value, which we'll call R1. Remember, we start at Ri. So um, you can show just with a little calculus that the um, volume change increment is just going to be 2 pi times r1 squared times dr, and then dA is going to be 4 pi times r1 times dr. So now we can write this expression in terms of dr rather than um, dv. Okay, so that's what I've done here. Here's our new expression for the change in Helmholtz free energy. And then if we divide both sides by dr, um, we come up with a differential equation here. So this tells us how the Helmholtz free energy will change as the radius changes. Now let's minimize the Helmholtz free energy, okay? So when we do an optimization problem like this, we are gonna set this derivative equal to zero. So that means that the right-hand side also has to be equal to zero, which means that the PV work is gonna equal the interfacial work. So that's what I wrote here. And then, um, we can solve this for the pressure difference, okay? And we arrive at this expression here, which you'll sometimes um, see referred to as the Young-Laplace equation. It's actually a particular solution of the Young-Laplace equation, um, more correctly called the Washburn equation. But the inter interesting thing here is that this predicts, just due to Helmholtz free energy minimization, that there's going to be a pressure discontinuity across the interface the bubble pressure is going to be larger than the pressure in the water surrounding it by a value equal to two sigma over R, okay? So the larger your bubble, the smaller that pressure difference is going to be. The smaller your bubble, the larger the pressure difference will be, okay? So going back to our capillary tube example, we know that there's going to be a pressure discontinuity across this interface. So this is one of my favorite interesting facts about this capillary tube experiment. What's the pressure in the air outside here? Well, it's, it's roughly one atmosphere, okay? If it's one atmosphere down here, it's gonna be very slightly less than one atmosphere up here just because you're moving above your datum, but it's, it's approximately one atmosphere. That means that as you cross from the air into the water, the pressure in the water is actually less than an atmosphere. So. That's kind of interesting. And then what happens is that the pressure in the water increases linearly just due to the weight of the water to be equal to one atmosphere down here at the base, okay? So the water phase pressure is sub-atmospheric here and it's one atmosphere down there. Now, what's actually holding up the column of the water? Well, it's, uh, it's wettability, okay? So if we actually zoom in on the contact of our meniscus with the glass, we will see that the air-water interface intersects that glass at some angle, which we're gonna call theta, and that's known as the contact angle, okay? Now, the, the magnitude of this contact angle is dictated by a balance of van der Waals forces and electrostatic forces, which attract and repel um, from the, uh, from the uh, glass surface, respectively. And so if we measure this angle theta through the water phase, um, we can classify what's called the wettability of this glass surface. So if theta is less than 60 degrees, this, we'll call this a water wet surface. Um, between 60 and 120, that's generally referred to as intermediate wetting. And then if it's greater than 120, water is actually not the wet wetting phase. And we would call this surface hydrophobic. Now you can observe this if you put a drop of water on a surface. So if we drop water on glass, you're going to end up here. And again, if you imagine um, measuring the contact angle through the water here, this is going to be an acute angle, and this would be a water wet surface. On the other hand, um, this is a hydro, hydrophobic surface. It's actually a lotus leaf, um, which is kind of interesting. A lot of uh, plant uh, you know, uh, vegetation is actually uh, water repelling, which is kind of cool. Um, and obviously this, you can see that the shape of that interface is a lot different and your angle here is gonna be 147 degrees in this case. And so this is gonna be not a water wet surface.
Okay, so um, the contact angle uh, has to do with the combination of the fluid and the solid properties, depends on how, how well they like each other. Um, and in this capillary tube case, if your glass is water wet, this will be an acute angle. And um, the interfacial tension vector, you actually have what's called a capillary force vector that acts in the plane of that interface. And the vertical component of that force vector is what's going to be holding up the water in the column. Okay. And so in this case, because um, this contact angle is not zero, this isn't this surface here isn't a perfect hemisphere. It's what's called a spherical cap. Okay. And the pressure difference across this has to be modified slightly by including this cosine of theta term here. And so that's what the pressure difference is across this interface in your capillary tube. Okay, so you're probably wondering, okay, Daigle, what in the world does this have to do with CO2 injection? Well, okay, now let's imagine you've got a set of capillary tubes and we'll flip the system on its side here. So we're not dealing with gravity, we're just dealing with pressure, okay? So um, if you're trying to inject carbon dioxide into these already water containing tubes, any meniscus that you form in these tubes will have a pressure discontinuity across it equal to two sigma cosine theta over R, whatever, whatever your radius is. So if I start ramping up the pressure of the CO2 here, where, which tube is going to get invaded first? Well, it's going to be the one with the largest radius, right? Because that's going to require the smallest pressure increment to um, move the CO2 in there. Okay, now this process is called drainage. So when you're taking um, a sample that's initially filled with what's the wetting phase for that, for that solid material, in this case, water, um, you're, and you're displacing it with a non-wetting fluid, this is gonna be drainage, okay? So if we continue our drainage, um, you know, eventually you'll get the pressure high enough to drain the second pore. And then finally, you'll get it, um, high enough to drain this pore up here, which has the smallest radius, okay? So let's imagine you've done that, you've gotten CO2 into all the pores. What happens when you start reducing the pressure? Well, the water is gonna come back um, in increasing order of pore size, okay? And this process is called imbibition, where the wetting phase comes back in and displaces uh, the non-wetting fluid, okay? So that was a very simple case. Now, the Pore network of, rock, of a rock is not a series of tubes, okay, but we often model it as such. So um, they're generally interconnected tubes and interconnected pores. So let's imagine we've got a very simple pore network composed, uh, we'll imagine that these are cylinders of different sizes and they're connected up. So we've got an inlet here, there's an outlet there, and there's another outlet here, okay. So let's take this poor network and imagine that it's initially filled with water. This is a water wet um, solid substrate, okay? So if we start injecting CO2 from this side, we'll drain that first pore whenever we reach its capillary entry pressure, which is going to be that two sigma cosine theta over R that'll allow us to form a stable meniscus in there, okay? Now we'll drain that pore, but because the two pores that it's connected to are smaller, those will not yet drain. So we've got to crank up the pressure to drain those next pores there. Now, what's interesting then is that, so you'll drain this pore, and then this pore also will immediately drain because it's larger. And so you'll already automatically be above its entry pressure. Okay, and then this pore will also drain because it's the same size as this pore. And then this pore will also drain because it's bigger and this pore again, because it's bigger, okay? So once we've drained all those pores, all that's gonna be left are these really small pores here. So we can imagine cranking up the pressure even more and we'll drain those two pores. Okay, now here's where things get interesting. If we draw down the CO2 pressure and allow water to come back in, what's gonna happen? Well, the gas is gonna leave the smallest pores first. So you, so you might be wondering, well, where does that water come from? Well, there's actually always a very thin film of water coating the walls of these tubes. So imagining there's some source of water over here, it'll wick itself in here by capillary forces and displace that um, CO2, okay? 
Now, if we crank the CO2 pressure down a little bit, here's where it gets interesting. Okay, so the pores that are green are the ones that are filled with CO2. So we've been able to displace the CO2 from this pore and this pore, but it's still trapped in here. And it's actually still trapped over here. Um, and it doesn't have a connected pathway to get out. So, um, you know, if we decrease it even more, the CO2 will leave here and it'll be stuck in here because we haven't, that gas has nowhere to go. Okay, now this is called residual gas, and this happens when you do a drainage and imbibition cycle. Uh, it's an important phenomenon for CO2 storage in the subsurface. So let's look at this in a little more geologically realistic sense. So let's imagine I've got um, a borehole where I'm injecting CO2, and I've got some saline aquifer here, you know, good porosity, good permeability. There is a sealing unit above it that prevents fluid migration. Um, what's gonna happen is you'll inject the CO2 down here. Now, because CO2 is less dense than water, um, it's gonna migrate upward, okay? Um, and it'll eventually you know, trap itself at the you know, highest, uh, highest point within the reservoir. But what's interesting is the rock down here, you injected the CO2 into it. And so initially it was saturated with brine and then um, you drained those pores. And then as the CO2 plume moved upwards, then you'll have an imbibition cycle again. So if we look at um, the rocks down here, they're gonna have residual CO2 left behind as the brine has come back in after the passage of the CO2 plume. And you'll have you know, a small amount of um, CO2 within those pores. We'll quantify this as uh, CO2 saturation. So that's the volume fraction of the pore space that's occupied by CO2. Um, higher up, uh, near the top of the plume, there's going to be more uh, CO2 up here. So the CO2 saturation is going to be larger. It's going to be occupying more of the pores. And so this actually is this residual CO2 is actually an important component of storage because it's actually very difficult for that stuff to move. What's more likely going to happen is over time it will dissolve or it will mineralize in here. Um, and so this is an important storage mechanism. Now, we haven't really talked much about this sealing unit, but it's actually a uh, it's going to be capillary forces that keep the CO2 from penetrating that seal unit. So let's look at a com com comparison of pore space in a typical sandstone. Here's our Berea sandstone sample again. Um, you know, again, these pores are 10 microns, maybe 100 microns. Now, here's a shale. So your sealing layers are going to be shales. Um, it's mostly made up of clay. Uh, there's really not much porosity. So this is a typical shale. You can see here is a five micron scale bar. What few pores you have in here are very, very small. They're nanometer, tens of nanometers in size, okay? So they're so small that basically the capillary pressure will never really get high enough to enter them if you're lucky, okay? You'll notice this crack here, okay? That can be a problem if you've got fractures. That can allow leakage from your seal. But as long as your pores are really small and you can control the you know, amount of CO2 you've got in there, um, you'll, you'll be in good shape. We'll talk in our next lecture actually about the quantitative analysis of that. But I just wanna close here by pointing out that many sedimentary basins that are being targeted for carbon sequestration have very thick alternating sequences of sandstones and then sealing layers, okay? So this is an example, this is the Frio sandstone. This is an example from uh, far southwestern Nueces County in Northern Cleburne County down here in, in uh, deep South Texas. And what we're looking at here, this is just a cross section of some old, um, some old gas wells here that could be turned into um, turned into injectors, injectors. And you'll notice here that these yellow layers, these are going to be your good sand layers. And then the light tan layers in between them, those are your seals. And so, you know, here's our depth scale here. I um, believe this is going to be in feet. So you've got, you know, a good 500 feet of these stacked sands, you know, various uh, facies of, 
of sands here. So, you know, you could potentially get a lot of good CO2 storage um, in here. You've got a good structural high here where you can accumulate CO2. So, you know, this is the type of thing you want to look for. Okay, so that's a little bit about rocks, a little bit of rudimentary petrophysics for all of you. Next time in what's going to be our final lecture on the CCUS unit, we're going to look at capillary seals in more detail. Um, talk about trapping mechanisms and CO2 EOR. And then I'll finish up just with some general thoughts on how feasible it's going to be to implement CCUS in the future. All right. Well, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you in our next lecture.